like Mary of Bethany at the feet of Jesus and just sit at his feet and learn from him and everything you have to say to us tonight through your word and through testimony, through conversation, speak to us, Lord, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Have a seat. We're here tonight to talk about the treasure principle. A lot of treasure hunters out there, and I think I'm looking at a bunch of them because I think you're like I am. Uh, I got a little confused about what the treasure really is. And it was in October of 2004 that a fire swept through our town, and me and one of my best friends who's sitting right in this room tonight uh, sat down and we thought about what really mattered when that fire came through and took houses and several lives. Maybe you heard about those big fires in Southern California. And we were there, and God got hold of me and helped me understand a little bit about what the treasure's about. You know, there's a lot of confusion about the treasure. But tonight we want to clear away some of that fog because we're going to meet two of the people who I think are best qualified to address what the real treasure is. So uh, um, we're excited to have you here tonight. We're so grateful. My name is Ken Kemp. I'm uh, uh, the uh, represent, representative of, of Operation Mobilization here in the Western United States, and it means I get the chance to, to uh, get to know people in Portland. And you know what? God is doing something really special in this town. I've been hearing stories that, uh, that are just amazing to me, and uh, it is just, it is just great to see all of you here. Now, I want to take a couple of minutes to say thank you to the folks who've worked very hard to make this thing happen. And the first guy I want to thank is our worship leader, Bill Drake. Did you enjoy that worship? Was that good? Let's, let's do that. I don't know where he went, but thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill has an amazing story. He's also been on a treasure hunt himself, and you know what? Uh, he, he was a Biola student and a, just a great musician, pretty good, pretty good at the keyboard, isn't he? And he also has a band that he plays with. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he was in Germany in front of 10,000 German students and leading them in worship, and it was just a powerful, powerful event. If you want to learn more about Bill's ministry, BillDrake.com is all you need to remember, BillDrake.com, and he'll be back here, and he's going to want to meet you too. Uh, There's another gentleman who is uh, seated here tonight that I want to say thank you, and it's Dr. Jay Barber. Dr. Jay, you have been an amazing champion for us, and um, uh, you have introduced us to the, the incredible people here at Sunset Presbyterian Church, and your care for us has been extraordinary. I also want to thank a guy whose name I couldn't even pronounce four months ago, and now I feel like I've been a, he's been a lifelong and one of my best friends. His name is Bill McLeod, Mission Connection. Where are you, Bill? Is he, is he sneak, is he out, he's probably out back talking to somebody, if you know Bill. We're just grateful to Bill and Mission Connection, and you probably noticed we've had quite a collection of volunteers to help us this evening with the book table and, and everything else, and we're grateful to each one of them. Uh, I'm also grateful to Kathy Nordquist, who uh, wor- works with Randy Alcorn at uh, Eternal Perspectives Ministries. Where are you, Kathy? Thank you so much for all you did to make this, this, uh, this evening work. And um, we have four really great churches who've been part of it. Uh, w- one of them is Crossroads Community Church and Ralph Cassell, it was one of the pastors there really helped us, and we got people. We do have people from Crossroads here, uh, and uh, Good Shepherd Community Church, um, 
Jonathan Martin and Raquel Thurman and her husband Pat have been very helpful to us. Solid Rock Church, Pastor Phil Comer has been an amazing champion for uh, what, we're tr- what we're doing tonight. But then especially, I'll mention again, the good people at, at uh, Sunset Presbyterian Church, Ann Owen and Karen Carroll and Travis who's doing the sound. And uh, the lead pastor we got to meet, Jason Curtis, and his partner, Michael Matusik, have been really, really amazing too. So let's, let's give a round of applause to all those good people who've helped us. And then one very special person uh, who is uh, someone who helps you get through all this wonderful Portland traffic in the afternoon from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, she's been an amazing supporter of ours and encourager to us. And you know what? She's here tonight. So I get to introduce you to one of your favorite people. Georgianne Rice is here. Will you stand up, Georgianne, and say hi to everybody? And yeah, yeah, let her know. Thank you, Georgianne. So good to see you here. Now, I get to introduce to you the president of Operation Mobilization in the USA. His name is Andrew Scott. It won't take you long to figure out that Andrew Scott was born and grew up in Northern Ireland. And as he was growing up, he decided that he was going to follow Jesus. He made that commitment. And what an incredible journey he's been on since then. He got inspired by a guy named George George Verwer. And it's taken him on an, an amazing path. And it's brought him to this place where he is tonight. And he is going to be our moderator. So will you please join me in welcoming our president, Andrew Scott. Do it, man. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. It's, uh, let me add my welcome to Cairns. It's so good to see you here tonight. And we look forward to this evening together. You know, what a privilege to be able to spend an evening with George Verwer and Randy Alcorn. Uh, They don't get to meet up themselves uh, personally face-to-face very much, in fact. Most of it's done either through phone calls or emails, so this is a privilege for them to actually share a stage together as well. But we get to sit and listen in to two men who God is using, has used tremendously over these last decades, and is continuing to use in these days. And so it's our privilege tonight. It's my privilege to be what they call the moderator, whatever that means. But I'm going to be asking a few questions uh, Uh, tonight to them. Let me first of all talk about the first man I want to bring out, a man who has uh, worn a number of hats in his his life, certainly a pastor for 14 years. And then in 1990, he founded the ministry and continues to direct that ministry, Eternal Perspectives Ministries. Uh, He's a man who's written just a few books. Uh, That would be 40, in fact, and and, uh, with over 7 million copies in print in 30 different languages. Quite incredible. Uh, three of them being New York Times bestsellers. Uh, Probably uh, the best decision of his life outside of following Jesus was that he chose Nancy to be his wife, and uh, maybe the best thing he's produced in his life are the two wonderful daughters he has that are are following hard after Jesus. And of course, something he had very little to do with uh, are the five grandchildren that he is proud to be the grandfather to. And uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce again tonight someone who doesn't really need an introduction, but can you welcome Randy Alcorn. (laughs) Welcome, Randy. You can have a comfy seat there. (laughs) Great. Well, the the other man is someone who started out in ministry life as a teenager, and at that age, he decided that uh, it was unfair that there was people in the world that had never heard of Jesus for the first time. In fact, there were hundreds of millions of them, and that disturbed him to the point where he decided to do something about that himself and tried to mobilize as many others to do the same thing. And from that early stage of taking a few people down to Mexico in the late 50s, very quickly there were thousands started to gather with him in, in Europe and joined with him, and quickly the organization Operation Mobilization was formed there in Europe in the early days. From that, uh, folks stuck around until today. The organization has grown to be 6,100 workers in 118 countries and uh, ministering to the unreached and marginalized throughout the world, bringing the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ to these folks. Uh, His wife is Drina, and they had three children also and five grandchildren as well, and they've been serving 
uh, as the leaders of OM for 40 years and handed over the leadership just a few years back, but still continues to run hard after the Lord, taking close to 400 meetings every year around the world. And of course, that person is someone I want you to welcome again tonight is George Verber. And George is only, only really comfortable when he has his big beach ball with him. Uh, we're going to bring the globe up on the stage. Thank you, Adam. There you go. It's just he gets bored easily and he likes to play with this. <laughs> no, this is a true reflection of George's heart for the nations. You don't want to just block Randy's view there. It's a brand new, it's a brand new one. one. Can I just move it back slightly so Randy's not <laughs> lost, lost behind the globe to these folks over here? We got Ireland right there. There you go. Let's turn that round center. <laughs> Good. Well, welcome, Randy and George. Good to have you here in front of uh, this crowd. And tonight, we're just going to spend some time together. But I'm really curious. I have a, we have a pastor, author from Portland, Oregon, and someone from originally from New Jersey, living in London, England, who's leading a mission agency. How, how on earth did you two folks get to meet each other? How did you connect? I think the first time we saw each other was at my home church, Good Shepherd Community Church, uh, where every year we have a, a missions conference and a featured mission speaker. And uh, it was uh, George one year, and it was at a time where we had six services, three <laughs> Saturday night services yeah. and three Sunday morning services. And of course, normally as a pastor, when you preach in those services, you preach the same message. Yep. George brought six different messages. <laughs> and so the small groups are all based around a discussion of the morning <laughs> message and that text. So you had people say, well, yeah, he spoke on Psalm 27. No, he spoke on John 10. No, it was Revelation 3, whatever. So that was so the first time. The confusion reigned. Can you remember anything more than that, George? Can you remember your six sermons? Well, the main thing I remember really about our linking are the books. I'm always looking for great books and purity principle and treasure principle came into my life really like a tornado out of heaven and that caused me eventually, I don't remember the dating, to really make contact with Randy and then we were thrown together in a conference, a pastor's conference with John Piper. That's the right. first time we really had some uh, right. time together but Praise God for email and for telephone that's enabled us to stay linked. We're, we're very different people in, in so many ways, and yet we're of one heart and one mind, not only about the gospel, but about the whole challenge of the unborn. And even this week, they've generously given to OM and the ships 10,000 more copies of Why Pro-Life, truly one of the most important books uh, in, in, in this century. I just come from Romania where they abort more children than are born. That's now true in a number of countries. So this is really what's brought us okay. together, the work of God, yep. rather than two, you know, great friends that are going around having pizza every other night. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. Randy, any other, th uh, what are the things or are those the main things that, that resonate between the two? The, um, George mentioned the unborn and, of course, the unevangelized as well. Mm -hmm. Is that, is those the the common themes that hold George Verwer and Randy Alcorn together? Well, certainly, uh, George is a, a model to me and a mentor from a distance, as he is to so many of us, um, in terms of being the, the pioneer, missionary, visionary, uh, the sheer amount of energy expended uh, by the grace of God throughout the world, the cause of Christ, you know, the missions. Those things are certainly close to my heart, but... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. I do a limited amount of traveling and speaking. Um, I'm usually working in my study, uh, and uh, George will call periodically, and I've gotten phone calls from George, I think probably from every continent uh, except Antarctica, and he's thinking of starting a ministry of the penguins, I think, and yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get something set up there. But uh, if, there's, if there's cell towers in Antarctica, George will probably yeah. be calling. But but honestly, uh, I, I have always been inspired by George from a distance, 
uh, and also in our personal conversations. Wherever he goes, the passion that he has for Christ. I remember one time we had a lengthy conversation from some country, wherever it was. Uh, it might have been India. And uh, at the end, he said, okay, this, it's been great talking with you. And then he said, don't do anything stupid. <laughs> and I said, that is so great. That's a great comment from pe- for people in Christian ministry to make to each other. Don't do anything stupid. And I like the word stupid because it wasn't simply don't do anything sinful, but it was a recognition that we bear on our shoulders the reputation of Christ, and let's not get in the way. Let's not do something stupid. And so the next couple conversations we had, I ended up by saying don't do anything stupid. And it's a great great encouragement. Very good. This is because of the increased uh, growth in the United States of the SSS, uh, which is really a serious uh, movement attacking older uh-huh. people. I've seen a lot of evidence of it, and I'm afraid I don't want it to come to me. You, you know, of course, Please, about the SSS. Please tell us what the SSS is. Uh, senior George. Stupidity Syndrome. Okay, yeah. right. <laughs> right. Thank you. I founded it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. At least we have a t- we have at least one takeaway from tonight. That's great. Thank Wear you. it as a badge of honor. <laughs> Good. Thank you for, for sharing that. George, you, uh, over 50 years ago, you founded OM, uh, and uh, you know, there was a bunch of teenagers really in those days with a lot of passion. And as you think back to those early days, what, what was the, the driving passion behind, uh, behind you starting this movement to... to reach the world. I, I really was one step at a time. I was not this person that had this great vision and great dream, sure. especially about starting any kind of organization. Just three of us went to Mexico, Dale and Walter and myself, and not that much happened, but it was a phenomenal experience for us. Whitcliffe translators welcomed us in Mexico City. And the, the, the history, the official history of the OM, uh, which is quite an expensive book tonight, is actually available uh, free of charge. And it has the picture of the team that went out the second summer when we really started something. Bookshops, radio broadcasts, correspondence courses, first full-time workers. And um, they, uh, they're they pictured in this um, picture up the here. The cover, yeah. Yeah, including Valdemar Aguilar, the Mexican who really helped things going. But I just had such a powerful life-changing experience in that Billy Graham meeting in New York City that I just felt everybody needs to know this is the way. He's the way, the truth. This, this is what I've been looking for. And so I began in my own high school. And one meeting in my high school, uh, some came to Jesus. Then we started prayer meetings. Then I started showing films. Then I started going door to door with Bibles and Christian books. And when I came back from Christmas break to this ungodly high school, many were drunk on the weekends. Uh, hundreds came to hear my testimony because I'd become president of the student council and people were talking about uh, George and what happened to him. So hundreds came to that meeting, and about 125 stood. I was was 18 by then, uh, to believe on Jesus, including my own father, the son of an atheist. So uh, it was one step at a time. But when I left university, partly because of Dale's influence, he went to Wheaton, I went to Moody. Then I was exposed to uh, people like Lionel Gurney of the Red Sea Mission Team, and so many godly people come through Moody. Alan Redpath that great preacher from London um, that ended up in Chicago. They became really a close friends. So I'm very indebted to men and women of God and their books and their lives uh, for helping me just one step at a time continue to grow. The real explosion came in Europe. We're really in more ways than one, a European born movement. This is very small and I was uh, launching, I challenged Dale to go to Turkey amazed that he accepted that challenge. And then I was in Spain and headed into the Soviet Union as learning some Russian. And that's when I was caught by the KGB, accused of being a spy. Uh, It's an amazing story. That failure caused me to go for a day of prayer where God gave the vision as it became known in the years to come. Operation Mobilization. Mobilize the European church to reach the Muslim world, the communist world, and especially the closed countries. So it was one step at a time, but 62 and 63, 50 years ago, was the big tipping point when close to 2,000 got involved in one summer, and it's been going ever since. 160,000 have served on OM 
When we stopped counting 25 years ago, they'd given the word of God, excluding radio and television, they'd given the word of God to one billion people face to face. Wow. Praise God. Yeah. Thank you, George. George mentioned in passing, and I just want to, Dale Roton, is he here, still here? Better be. I can't no, see, where are you? Dale, the backsliders. <laughs> Dale's at the back. But Dale was in the beginning with George, helping to found this organization. He's sitting at the back, and uh, so you can get to say hi to Dale later on. Thank Let you Let me for give coming. an example of how Dale helped me. I was ministering in Manchester, I'll never forget, and you, in those days, I, thank God I don't think I do it much anymore, I would sometimes exaggerate something and or you know, say something over the top. After the meeting, Dale has really been the Nathan in my life, and we all need a Nathan. And if you don't know him, you might try like reading the Bible. But <laughs> uh, Dale came to me and said, you know, Brother George, God's really used you again, and you know, so encouraged. You, you like to get positive feedback. And then he said, but, and I'll never forget it. You know, if you could like stay closer to the truth, God could use you even more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dale. Yeah, Thank excellent. You. Good. Good work. Randy, George mentioned just this whole idea of bringing the gospel to everybody. That was yeah. the driving, what, the passion right at the very beginning of OM. And I know both from our short conversation, but also from what I've read about you, that evangelism, evangelizing the unevangelized is a huge passion for your ministry and for you personally. Uh, just share a little bit of how that works itself out. And I know you have a new exciting project just about to be launched. Tell us a little bit about that. That's purely focused at evangelizing. Uh, do we have that video? If we do, now would be the time to play it. I'm not sure if it's ready to go or not. Uh, Two like men yeah. live in the same neighborhood. Phineas, wealthy, powerful, owner of a great estate. Everyone knows his name. Lazarus, destitute, disabled, homeless, a nobody who begs on the street outside the rich man's gate. Two men, which would you rather be? Phineas, cruel, angry, ungrateful. Lazarus, kind, generous, thankful. Phineas trusted himself. Lazarus trusted his God. Lazarus listened to and believed the words of Jesus. Phineas tried to stamp out the words of Jesus. Lazarus died and was buried in a poor man's grave. Phineas died and had the best funeral money could buy. Which man would you rather be? Lazarus was mourned by friends who loved him. Phineas was mourned only by those paid to do so. When Lazarus died, he went to heaven. When Phineas died, he went to hell. Now, which man would you rather be? Rich Phineas or poor Lazarus? Two men, two destinies. Those destinies hinge on whether they trust one other man. Two men no longer live in the same neighborhood. Two choices, each lasting for eternity. Eternity by New York Times bestselling author Randy Alcorn. Available from Kingstone Comics. Read it. Give it. Live it. So this is my first graphic novel, and uh, I considered this to Looks be... like a comic to me. Uh, it de yes, they used to call them comics. Yes, Who's into comics big time? And there you go. You're too young for that, I guess. <laughs> And uh, I grew up reading comic books uh, in a non-Christian home. Uh, I learned to love to read through reading comics. I graduated to <laughs> science fiction. Uh, and then when I was exposed to the gospel, I read the Bible itself and every Christian book I could get my hands on. And as a result, God changed my life. Uh, came to Christ through reading the Word of God. But now I look at a younger generation where many of the boys in particular, uh, but the girls also to a degree, have, have grown up in uh, such uh, video game saturation, um, videos, movies, everything highly visual, that 
many of them, especially from non-Christian homes, but even some in Christian homes, are not going to read the kinds of books I write. So one day I had been asked if I would write a graphic novel, and I was thinking about it, praying about it, and I went to a big Barnes & Noble store here, those of you who are local, Clackamas Town Center, and I went to the graphic novel section, and I would encourage you to go to it and just ask where it is if you've never been there, but just go to it uh, and, and watch all of these young people come in, and a lot of them have tattoos, they've got facial jewelry, they've, they're, they're sometimes uh, teenagers, uh, sometimes they're younger, uh, sometimes they're in their 20s, even to mid-30s, and I looked at those young people and I thought, how many of them ever go to church? And I don't know the answer, but in the state of Oregon, very few people go to church anyway, and these would not be likely candidates. And I thought, I want to reach those people. I mean, I want to take God's Word and a story from God's Word that Jesus told, and that's when that one came to my mind, and I want to bring the gospel into that and weave in Christ, not only as the teller of the story, but who he really is, the message of salvation, heaven and hell. And if it's done beautifully, uh, then I believe they'll read it. And if the story is told well. So there is a, an artist for, who does Marvel comics, uh, artistry, and he was terrific. And the book is at the printer now and will be out this next month. And I'm totally excited about this book because of reaching another uh, audience, a new demographic it's called, but that's people that Jesus loves and wants to draw to faith. It's part of, as a writer for me, it's like becoming all things to all men, Amen. that by all means we might reach some. Wonderful. Amen. And we're uh, sending out, I think, something like 5,000 of those or so to the Lagos Hope, uh, the ship that goes to so many. And how many people come on that ship Hundreds year? and thousands. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like 100,000 of those, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to make any deals in here. I was <laughs> trained how to buy at Walmart. Yes, and then George wants me to nod my head in front of a group of people. That's, that's for exactly sure. right. But I, I'm coming to your rescue here, Randy. No I deals actually, in here. I actually had that happen one time with George where uh, I, he, I said something like, we'll send 3,000 of these or whatever, and, and then, you know, the email comes back, thank you so much for promising 6,000 of those. And I go, so what do you do? Well, of course, you said 6,000. You need, you need deal in your life. He corrects those <laughs> figures. You see, that's... <laughs> but it's all for the kingdom. Yeah, so there very we go. good. Thank you. Well, that's an exciting project, and thank you for the five that's going, 5,000 that's going out. That was a log of soap. Uh, thank you for the 10,000 that's going... <laughs>